I think there's a really good contingent of contenders in the ACC. I really like the league. I, I do. I think the top half of the league has really gotten good. And it wasn't that way. It really wasn't. For a while there, it was one, two, maybe three teams that could play at a remarkably high level. Now I think there are four teams that no doubt can play at a crazy high level. Hello and welcome in. Today is Thursday, February 8th, and we hope that you're enjoying the show wherever you're getting the show, whether that's on the ESPN YouTube channel. If you're here with us via the podcast, please continue to like, rate, and subscribe to the show wherever you get it. And we appreciate you so much for being here. I'm Greg McElroy. Along with me, as always, Jake Garcia, Jack Foster, Mark Kubiak. We have a terrific show in store for you today. We're going to go through the playoff probability of the ACC, the Big 12, and Notre Dame. So we have a very exciting show. We did this already for the Big Ten. We've done this already for the SEC. So it'll be really interesting to see how these kind of all factor out. But right now, there's a lot of things in the ACC and the Big 12 to be very excited about. And I think Notre Dame has a chance to have a special season as well. Before we get things kicked off with the playoff probability discussion, isn't it interesting? I mean, I remember as a college football fan, and I'm talking not, not when I was a player, Not when I was a recruit. Uh, I'm talking about as a college football fan, when signing day coverage on ESPNU was appointment television. You remember, I I would like wake up as if it was Christmas and I didn't even really follow recruiting. I've never really gotten that into it. I've never, I've never had the time to really dive deep in the weeds with what these, co- what these high school kids are doing, who's going where, the hat flipping game. I mean, they had all these pretty remarkable, you know, announcements that were made on signing day. Isn't it crazy that in the span of just a handful of years, six, maybe seven, when they started to implement the December signing period, and we knew that that was kind of a formality because at that point, more and more guys were opting to enroll mid-year. But remember when it was like Christmas Day? And I, and I know there are a lot of guys signing, so I'm, I'm not at all trying to minimalize the accomplishment that was had by so many high school players yesterday. It's an incredible accomplishment. It's a lifelong dream. I know that there are several guys that signed yesterday that will go on to have incredible careers, many of which, the handful of guys that were there in the ESPN 100, they're in the 247 top 250, and a lot of guys that were big-time recruits that decided to announce yesterday. But it's crazy how pretty much all the signing classes are already established and how quickly that has changed. And how much it's just kind of changed our viewing habits and our viewing behavior and and all those things as college football fans. So a tip of the cap to everybody that signed yesterday, tip of the cap to everybody that signed a couple weeks ago on the original signing day. But it'll be interesting here in the next few weeks for us to evaluate some of these recruiting classes and how some of these young players might factor in early in their college career. But the meat of the show today will center around the college football playoff probability discussion. Let's get things kicked off with the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. We'll get things kicked off with the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Before we get to the rest of the ACC, we're going to lump Notre Dame in right here. And as you look, as you look through the teams that we're going to go through in the ACC and the Big 12, the numbers that you saw in the SEC and the numbers that you saw in the Big 10 aren't going to be reflected in some of these other leagues. Why? Because I don't think... These leagues have as good of a chance to get an at-large bid as some of the leagues that we've already talked about, the Big Ten and the SEC primarily. Of course, Notre Dame, their only pathway to make the college football playoff is by way of the at-large. So it is very much dependent on the decision that's made by the college football playoff executive panel. Is it going to be six automatic qualifiers or is it going to be seven? automatic qualifiers one less spot means lowers the chances for the Irish but I love the team they bring back Marcus Freeman enters year number three which I think you know people have kind of had question marks about his process maybe there were moments last year where they didn't play as well the Louisville game stands out the Clemson game stands out but there were some really good moments last year as well the USC game was a resounding victory. There was a lot of positives to take away from year number two, even though most people will look at the year that they had Sam Hartman and say that was a missed opportunity. Sure. They, they also took Ohio State to the brink. 
I think they had a lot of really good moments, and there was progress made from year one under Marcus Freeman to year two. I also think they've made a significant addition in bringing back Mike Denbrock, who's going to be the offensive coordinator. He was at LSU, and the job he did with Jaden Daniels and the job he did with that offense as a whole was pretty remarkable. Any losses that LSU experienced last year were certainly not because of their performance on that side of the ball. So Mike Denbrock being back at Notre Dame is massive. Another massive coup was bringing in Riley Leonard, including, you know, all of his experience, I think is massive. Now, let, let's be real for a second. I look at Riley Leonard, I think he's got a really high ceiling. The problem is, I don't think he's anywhere near where he can be. And this is going to happen with downfield accuracy. Accuracy on throws that travel 10 or more yards downfield. If you look at Riley Leonard, he's not, he's, he's not an inaccurate player. But the consistency on the downfield throws just isn't there. And part of that had to do with what he was asked to do at Duke. He was asked to rely a lot on his legs, especially against top competition a la Clemson week one. If you watch him, he's getting the ball out really quickly because his offensive line at that time, they weren't sure how they were going to jail. So they asked their quarterback, hey, get the ball out. Don't let this defensive line, don't let this pass rush for Clemson get home. So he was getting the ball out, and then he kind of got hurt. And so it's, it's tough to evaluate the 23 season for Riley Leonard, but I think there's a lot left in the tank. It's just, can he get there? That's a big question. Because if you actually look at what Mike Denbrock did with Jaden Daniels, Jaden Daniels had really good moments, really good moments early in his career at Arizona State. Now he was inconsistent, but he always had wheels. Well, Riley Leonard's always had wheels, but there have been a lot of moments of inconsistency. So hopefully Mike Denbrock can accelerate the development of Riley Leonard and he can look a little bit more like Jaden Daniels, who brought home the Heisman Trophy last year. That would be tremendous. I thought there were some significant losses on the roster. When I look back, and I guess we just haven't spent enough time on Notre Dame, there are a lot of departures off this team, but there's a lot of guys back that have played high quality football. Some of the notables though, Sam Hartman's gone at quarterback, Joe Alt going to be a top five, top 10 pick at worst in the NFL draft at left tackle. Blake Fisher, who was at right tackle last year, very inconsistent times last year, didn't play, I think his best football, but he's out as well. JD Bertrand, rock solid middle linebacker, him being gone is significant. He's the signal caller and meant a lot to that team. Uh, and then you lose Maris Leofau as well. So him being out, a couple of guys at the second level that I do think will be difficult to replace, but I think they have adequate reinforcements coming there at the linebacker core. Audric Estime, of course, is massive as well, but I think they're deep at running back. So that one is not going to concern me overly, at least right and now. Here's the ones that bother me, okay? Chris Tyree transferring to Virginia. That one's massive. He was, at times, outside of Estime and Mitchell Evans, he was their most dynamic playmaker. Holden Stays, their most dynamic tight end, at times, last year. I think he was somewhat underutilized. He's now transferring to Tennessee, where I'm sure he's hoping to catch a few more passes in that little bit more pass-happy attack. Rico Flores transferred to UCLA. They were very high on him. He had a lot of juice. He was young obviously, but now him leaving, they lose the potential juice on the outside with Rico Flores. Tobias Merriweather was another guy that they really liked. He's transferring to Cal. Braylon James is out. Their center, Zeke Carell, is out. And Ramon Henderson is a really good cover safety. He transferred to UCLA as well. So there was a quite a bit of turnover, especially at wide receiver. And I look at the wide receivers that were brought in. I'm not doubting that they have decent players at wideout. They still bring back Jaden Thomas. They still bring back Jordan Faison, who I think has got a chance to be a really good slot receiver. And then Jaden Greathouse is back. Now he's a sophomore, hopefully a little bit more advanced in his development. Mitchell Evans will return from the knee injury. And Eli Raridan, who was sidelined most of the beginning of last year. He's six foot six and can run. And they're at tight end. That's a really nice one-two punch. Mentioned the running back depth. They should be good there. Jeremiah Love and Jadarian Price, they're going to be just fine. I'm not going to lose any sleep about running backs, and they did add a couple pieces in the portal, including FIU's Chris Mitchell, who went for over 1,100 yards last year. Then you get Bo Collins from Clemson, who I think is solid but unspectacular, and Jaden Harrison, who's a wide receiver from Marshall. Uh, we'll be curious to see how those guys factor in to kind of spell Thomas, Faison, and Greathouse, who are likely to be the starters. On the defensive side, should be pretty solid. 
Howard Cross and Riley Mills return up front. Riley Mills, I think, really came into his own as the season went along. And Howard Cross has progressively improved. Even though he's undersized, he's very difficult to contain. The addition of RJ Oban at defensive end from Duke was big. And then Rod Hurd, I think, rounds out. He's the transfer from Northwestern. He plays kind of a slot, nickel, can play safety. I think Rod Hurd's a really good player, by the way. They also brought in Jordan Clark from Arizona State. I think this safety has a chance to be elite. Big time elite. You got two All American candidates. One was an All American last year in Xavier Watts. And then you have a freshman All American from two years ago in Benjamin Morrison. So I think their secondary has a chance to be among the nation's best. And then in the front end of that secondary, you'll get Jalen Sneed, who's extremely athletic and poised for a big year, and Jack Kaiser to kind of be the one two punch there at linebacker. So I think they are really solid from top to bottom. Will they be as deep as they were a year ago? That's a legitimate question, but I think they're in really good shape. The one question mark remains is the wide receiver position. That was the question mark last year, and I think depth along the defensive line is something I'll be trying to identify a little bit earlier as well. There's a couple guys that have played. Burnham, Batello, a couple others too, so they should be okay. It's just I don't know if they're going to be quite as disruptive as they were at times last year. Let's look at the schedule at a and very tricky game to start things off. I think that's a toss-up. You go on the road and win against your former defensive coordinator. That's a big one. Duke played Notre Dame really well last year. We all know who the head coach was at Duke last year. So that'll be a tricky one, I think, to come out of the gate there, especially in August. It's going to be a billion degrees, depending on what time is kicked. That thing could be a billion degrees there. At 3.30 in the afternoon, if that's when it's kicking off, whew, it's going to be a scorcher. They're in Kyle Field. NIU at Purdue. I think at Purdue is going to be a tricky one. I lean Notre Dame pretty heavily, but that is a game that is certainly one that you need to be a little careful with. Then you get to the middle part of your schedule. They're middle, late September, all the way through middle of October. Miami, Ohio, Louisville, and Stanford, they're all at home. I know Louisville got them last year, and Louisville has adequately reinforced some of the pieces that they lost. But I don't know, man, going into Notre Dame when that's probably been a revenge game circled for the Irish, I have a hard time envisioning them getting this one. So worst case scenario right now, you got one, maybe two losses. I think I think it's very possible, too, that going into the game on the road at Georgia Tech on October 19th, you're sitting there at 5-0 and or 6-0. and At Georgia Tech... Well, it'd be a tricky game. You look at Georgia Tech, they got great team speed. I think they're going to be a lot better this year. They're going to be that disruptive piece there in the ACC with Haynes King. They have elite speed at, at wide receiver. They have elite speed at running back. That's a team that you need to be very, very careful with. So be careful on October 19th when you travel to Atlanta. Navy, Florida State comes to you, Virginia, and then you go to USC in the final week of the season to play the USC Trojans. I'm thinking right now, nine and three for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Some people on this show, named Mark Kubiak, think 10-2 and two is the floor. I think that's a little bit presumptuous because we have seen Notre Dame lose games they shouldn't lose in the past. I think their odds of making the playoff in 2023, especially not knowing exactly what the playoff format's going to look like, is around 40%, which, by the way, is pretty dang good. I know people are going to say, that's not good. I think that's actually pretty good. I really do, especially with the non-conference road game. Obviously, everything's non-conference, but a road game to a and early and a couple other tricky road games like Georgia Tech, Purdue, and then at SC with Florida State coming to you. So I think 9-3 and three is about right. I could see 10-2, and two, but I don't think 10-2 and two guarantees you a spot. But I think in all likelihood, you go 10-2, and two, you're in a really good chance to potentially get to the 12-team playoff. Let's move now into the ACC. I think there's a really good contingent of contenders in the ACC. I really like the league. I, I do. I think the top half of the league has really gotten good. And it wasn't that way. It really wasn't. For a while there, it was one, two, maybe three teams that could play at a remarkably high level. Now I think there are four teams that no doubt can play at a crazy high level. And then there's some fringe teams that you don't want to mess around with. Like I'm not going to list NC State in this breakdown. I'm just going to tell you in advance. I don't have NC State right now as a playoff contender. But I tell you what, I don't want to mess with them. That's for sure. Right now, I don't have Georgia Tech as a playoff contender. They got way too much ground to make up, but I'm telling you, man, they can be very dangerous. And they can knock off one of your playoff contenders. I don't have North Carolina as a playoff contender, but these teams are dangerous. 
very dangerous. So I think there's a lot of potholes in the ACC. And I also think the top half of the ACC has improved greatly. Let's start with the defending champs, the Florida State Seminoles. Here's the thing. They've lost almost everybody off of last year's 13-1 football team. But they did hit the portal really hard. The biggest question I have for Florida State is how does DJ Ui Angalale fit into this offense? Because if you look at what Jordan Travis was and what they've really recruited to, they really wanted a mobile quarterback that's got some twitch. Now, DJ Ui Angalale is mobile, but I would not describe him as a guy that's twitchy. He's not going to be a guy that's going to make you miss in the backfield and then take off and, and burn you. He's a mover and shaker, and he can create hard yardage. He's great in short yardage situations. He's good on quarterback design power between the tackles. He's going to be great after contact. He's a big guy, and he's really strong, and he's pretty dang athletic. But he's not really that twitchy guy that they've had in the past and that they've had success with. So I will be really curious how... They're going to factor his skill set, which is really good off play action. He's got a big arm so he can push the ball down the field. He's a pretty good deep ball thrower. How will they block it up for him in this offense is probably going to look a little different. A guy that I'm very intrigued by is Jalen Brown. He's a wide receiver. He's a transfer from LSU. He's a 10-5 on the 100-meter track guy. Regional champion in the 100-meter dash back in high school. State qualifier in the 200 dash. Now, what does that mean? He's a true deep threat. Uh, and knowing what DJ Uyunglele has been in the past with a true deep threat, a guy that can really take the top off the defense with that consistent threat of the run, Jalen Brown might be a really impactful player for them in the transfer portal. They also went to Tuscaloosa and grabbed five transfer players from the Crimson Tide. Earl Little, I think, is the best of all the guys that transferred out. I thought he had a chance in Tuscaloosa to really be a starter, be a top-end contributor there at corner. So him being gone, that was a massive pickup for Mike Norvell. I also think Terrence Ferguson, along the offensive line, probably going to settle in at guard. I think that's going to be a really big pickup as well because the one thing that Florida State didn't have last year was a real mauling front. They were athletic, and they did a good job playing in unison. They had a lot of veteran presence along the offensive line. They didn't have that mauler, that guy that's just going to force you off the spot whether you like it or not, and Terrence Ferguson has a chance to be that guy. Roy Dell Williams, I think, will be solid. He was really more of a kind of tackle-to-tackle back, downhill guy, very powerful runner, but not a guy that's going to have crazy breakaway speed, but he should be a solid contributor. Malik Benson, I don't know what to expect from him. I really don't. I had big hopes, high expectations for him in Tuscaloosa. It just never really materialized. So I'll be curious to see with the new opportunity there at in Tallahassee, how will he handle it? And then Sean Murphy, who is a linebacker that's going to probably play inside, is not crazy athletic, not crazy fast, but he's really good playing downhill and is going to be sturdy against teams that will try to run it downhill as well. The defensive line, I think, is going to be really, really important. Because if you look at Florida State last year, so much of their success was derived along the defensive line. We all knew about Jared Verse. Braden Fisk, I thought, got his respect as the season went along, probably earned it and probably deserved it a little earlier. But they've been very good along the defensive front for many, many years. Marvin Jones transfers down from Georgia. I think that might be the biggest pickup that they had in this past offseason. He's one of the best pass rushers of his class a couple years ago. He was a breakout player just waiting for his opportunity at Georgia. It came at times just not as much as he probably would have liked. I think he's got a chance to be a takeover the game guy, much like Jared Verse was and much like Jermaine was a couple years ago. So I love the addition of Marvin Jones. I think he's going to be big time. And to know, too, that he gained 30 pounds between his junior and senior year, there's still, I think, some some growth to be had there and some strength to be picked up. So very optimistic about what he's going to add ter- there to the edge of that defense. I also think adding Oregon State defensive end uh, Sione Lolohea, that was big. A big veteran guy, big body edge defender that's going to be great against the run at 270 pounds. That was massive. And then Tamiwa Durojaye, uh, a transfer from West Virginia is another guy that I think could factor in very early. The big question I have for Florida State, much like Notre Dame, he's got some young receivers that are going to need to step up. Some young receivers that, that were kind of waiting in the wings last year. They're talented. They have good players at those positions. But you have some guys that haven't been placed in featured roles just yet. 
Will they be able to live up to the expectations of what the previous class was able to do? Let's look at the schedule. Georgia Tech in Dublin. I've already said, I think Georgia Tech's a dangerous team this year. Boston College, they come to Doak. I think they'll be able to handle their business there. Memphis is at Doak. Cal is at Doak. They're at SMU. I like their chances of being able to get all those games. So Florida State should comfortably be 5-0 and before they welcome Clemson Tigers to Doak Campbell. Regardless of how good Clemson is, how good Florida State is, how bad either one might be, this game is always going to be a war. Probably going to be the toughest game on the schedule for Florida State, but I like their chances because it's in Doak, even though there's a lot of question marks that still need to be answered in the first five weeks of the season. You go to Duke, you got Miami on the road. Very difficult game as well. I'll talk about Miami in a minute. I think Miami's got a chance to be special. I do. I have a chance to be really special. Now they got to quit shooting themselves in the foot. But they also, I think, have a chance to be very, very dangerous and a real legitimate playoff contender this year. North Carolina is in the Doak. You're at Notre Dame. Very tricky game. I think that game's a toss-up, at least at the moment. Charleston Southern, and you finish up with the Florida Gators. I think you should handle your business in each of the last two games. So I look at the playoff probability for the Florida State Seminoles, and I don't think a lot of people are going to like this. I think there are three, maybe four, losable games. I don't think they'll lose all four. I think at worst you lose three. I think in many cases you probably lose two. So 10 and two, what are the odds of getting to the playoffs from 10 and two? I think you're about 33%. And that's where I have the probability for the Florida State Seminoles. Let's go next to the Miami Hurricanes. They landed maybe the biggest fish in the portal. They landed, landed Cam Ward from Washington State. He was at first... You know, it was a bit of a tug of war between Florida State and Miami, and then the NFL draft came, and he said, you know, I'm going to go to the NFL. Then ultimately backed out of the NFL draft evaluation process and decided to pick Miami. This was a massive pickup, a massive pickup. Now, Cam Ward is really special when it comes to improvisation, but one thing he's going to have to learn in Shannon Dawson's system, he's going to have to play in rhythm a little bit more. He's going to have to stay in scheme a little bit more. When the play breaks down, he's got to run around and make a play. There's few better in the entire sport. But can he stay in rhythm and rely on what I think is an excellent one-two punch at wide receiver? Xavier Restrepo and Jacoby George are back. You have a really good tandem and running back as well with Henry Parrish and Mark Fletcher. I think Mark Fletcher is going to be that workhorse downhill, big body back that's going to impose his will. And Henry Parrish will live a little bit more on the edges, but he does a pretty good job running between the tackles as well. The O-line and D-line should be a strength. More than likely, it was last year. That was maybe the most improved position group in the sport with what Miami looked like two years ago to what they looked like last year. And then the defensive line has an anchor in Reuben Bain, so they should be in great shape there. And then, of course, Mario Cristobal, like Mario Cristobal always does, he landed a top five recruiting class. So they should be in a really good spot there. They might be young in a few places, but they were young last year, and those young players were ready to step right in and play well at a high level for the Hurricanes throughout the season. They start the season at Florida. will be tricky. Uh, I know you're going to sit there and say Florida's not very good. Yeah, I don't disagree. I think Miami's a lot better than Florida, but it's still in Gainesville. It's still a rivalry game. That game is a toss-up. Then they got uh, Florida A&M, Ball State at South Florida. Virginia Tech comes to them. I think Virginia Tech's a tricky team to play as well. But the fact that it's at home, I like their chances. And then they go to Cal. Be careful on the road trip to Cal. Just saying, be careful. That's the game before the bye week. I don't think you're going to lose it. But that's a long way to travel, and it's the week before you get a week off. And we know how sometimes Miami has kind of slept walk at times and long road trips and just tricky scene. That's one that I would be careful with for sure. I still think Miami will handle their business in that game. They go on the road to Louisville on October 19th. That's after the bye. And then the Florida State Seminoles come to them. That's a really difficult two-game stretch for the Canes, but I think they should be in good shape at worst. Maybe they split those two games. Duke is the game after that. They're at Georgia Tech. I've already referenced. It's a tough team. Wake Forest, and they finish on the road at Syracuse. Be careful with that road trip to Syracuse. Much like the Florida State Seminoles, I think Miami's about a 10-2 football team. Could they rally up and go 11-1? Absolutely. Could they go 9-3? and Without question. But I think 10-2 and is probably the most likely scenario for the Canes. So I'm going to put their playoff probability at 33%, just like I had with the Florida State Seminoles. Remember, the winner of the ACC gets an automatic berth in the college football playoffs. So these are the three teams that I think it could come down to. It's probably going to be pretty easy to guess where the playoff probability is 
with the Clemson Tigers. That's who's up next. Another portal came and went. Another portal season, portal cycle, whatever you want to call it. Dabo Sweeney did not add a transfer. They did try, though. They went after multiple offensive linemen. But if you look at last year's team, yes, they won five in a row down the stretch. And a lot of the optimism that I have with Clemson this year is the fact that a lot of the guys that were playing pivotal roles in that stretch run were young guys that are going to be back and involved in this team. Cade Klubnick at quarterback. He returns another year in the system. Another year in the system with Garrett Riley. He should be more advanced, I would hope, knowing that he's now a little bit more comfortable in the system that he's familiar with. But now in year number two, that maybe you can kind of go from algebra to, you know, uh, you go from pre-algebra to algebra. You go from algebra to trig, whatever it is. I don't even know. Uh, but anyways, calculus, perhaps. All right, so maybe he's going to the next level there in Garrett Riley's system. Phil Moffa was massive last year down the stretch. Very physically imposing back. Not a guy that has crazy, outrageous breakaway speed. Man, not a lot of people caught it, and he always seemed to find the hole. He always seemed to find the hole. So I love that he's back, and he should be a really good fit in this offense, would love to see him even more involved in the passing game that aren't screens too. So maybe that's the next step of his development. I think their wide receiver core is rock solid, assuming they can all stay healthy. And that was a big assumption because last year there were times where a bunch of guys missed time. Cole Turner missed time. He was out down the stretch, got hurt early in the season. Antonio Williams missed quite a bit of time. He's back as well. He's been the number one in the past. I expect him to be a number one again. And then Tyler Brown was a little banged up with an ankle at times, but he could be a number one guy too. So you have three guys that are very much top of the roster, top of the high-end, high-end wide receiver prospects. You just got to stay healthy. And you add Troy Stilato, who I think did some nice things for him, and the tight end Jake Brinningstool, who's returning as well. That's massive. The offensive line also returns mostly intact, with the exception of Will Putnam, which is a big loss. He was the center last year and was probably the most physically imposing guy there at center uh, that they've had in quite a while. I mean, he's really a good player. Now, they lost quite a bit on defense, so they'll be a little thinner. And they've been in recent years. You lose Jeremiah Trotter. You lose Xavier Thomas. You lose Tyler Davis. You lose Ruka Roboro. You lose Nate Wiggins. So they lose quite a bit on the defensive side. But they do have guys that have been kind of rotating into the lineup from time to time. So now it's time for a guy like Wade Woodass, who's going to fill in for Jeremiah Trotter. He's got to take his game to the next level. The good news is he still has Barrett Carter to his side. He should be in good shape. And the defensive line will be anchored by two guys that were freshmen a year ago that I think are poised for breakout campaigns. That's TJ Parker and Peter Woods. Two guys that at times last year played well beyond their years. Very optimistic about their development and really think that those two can really anchor a defensive line that's been very proud for the better part of the last decade. And then finally in the back end, yes, they'll miss Wiggins for sure, but they do bring back Khalil Barnes. They do bring back Avion Terrell. Uh, Terrell. So they have some good pieces in the back end. I love Khalil Barnes too, by the way. I think this guy is just a playmaker, man. He played the nickel quite a bit last year, played a little bit at safety. I think part of the reason why Andrew Makuba transferred is because Barnes' is emergence. So I think he's got a chance to have a really special year. Now, the schedule is very difficult for the Clemson Tigers. It gets kicked off in a neutral site game against the Georgia Bulldogs. That'll be in Atlanta. That'll be a very, diff- very difficult game. We know Georgia's going to be a top two, top three team at worst heading into this upcoming season. So that game's a toss-up. Lean Georgia, though, at least at the moment. So right now, you're looking at a possibility for the second straight year where Dabo Sweeney might start 0-1. And you got Appalachian State. NC State comes to you. Very tricky game, but the fact that it's in Death Valley, I feel a lot better about Clemson's chances there. Stanford comes to you as well. You go to Florida State there on October 5th. That'll be a very difficult game. But one that Clemson is is not scared of. <laughs> They'll play at a high level in that one. And then things down the stretch get a little bit more manageable. They're at Wake Forest, Virginia, and Louisville. Uh, Virginia and Louisville come to them. Wake Forest on the road shouldn't be too chaotic of an environment there in Winston-Salem. So they should handle their business right when they go on the road there in that three-game stretch. They go to Virginia Tech. Be very tricky on November 9th. Be careful in that game. Be very, very careful. At Pitt, still not sold on Pitt necessarily turning the corner just yet. Citadel and then South Carolina comes to Clemson this year. I think they'll handle their business. I think they're looking at about a 10-2 and two season as well. Uh, I think 11-1 is very much possible. It really hinges on that Florida State game. They can get the Florida State game on the road. I think their playoff probability increases drastically. But if they can't get that one, I think it drops significantly. So I'm going to three wide net there in the ACC. 
playoff probability for the Clemson Tigers at 33%. So just to make sure, you only have one team from the ACC getting in the college football playoff and they'll be a top four seed. Not necessarily at all. I think one of those teams, if they do go 10-2, and two, let's say Clemson beats Georgia, then now Georgia's, I already have Georgia at like a 90% when we did it a couple weeks ago. Georgia's at 90. I think they'll beat Clemson. But in the event they don't, then Georgia would drop down to like a 60. Clemson would go up to a 60. So that's really the hinge game on the at-larges. As far as the other teams and their at-larges, it's really the Notre Dame situation. Notre Dame, they handle their business against, say, Florida State at home. Their number will go from 40 to 55. And Florida State's would drop from 33 to maybe 25. But I still think Notre Dame needs that more than Florida State because Florida State still has the possibility of earning that automatic qualifier. So it's all kind of these teams. Now, there's a reason why we did all these together because they really kind of impact each other with Notre Dame vying for one of those at-larges and these three teams kind of jockeying to figure out who's getting the automatic qualifier and in the event in which they do have another team that's in the running for one of the at-larges, what will their record be and how will they have fared in games against each other And then how will they have fared in games against the non-conference? And there are some significant non-conference hurdles for a few of these teams to handle. Miami has to go to Florida. Uh, We already know that Clemson has, uh, or Florida State has to go to Notre Dame. And Clemson has to play against Georgia. So the non-conference is going to determine just how well, uh, just how likely they are to get a non-conference or get to an at-large bid. But I think it's up in the air. So at this point, I'm going to hedge my bet, say 33% across the board but we can adjust depending on how they fare in the non-conference. All right, moving on to the Big 12. Remember, winner of the Big 12 will get an automatic berth in the college football playoff. Let's start with the Utah Utes. I think they're the favorite. Part of it, I love Cam Rising. <laughs> I also love Brant Keithy. I also love Mike Bernard. I also love Levani DeMuni uh, and Karine Reed. I love Ziamaya Vaughn at corner. Like These guys have some real, real quality pieces that are back. So I think Utah actually comes in in a really good position to rally up and win the league in year number one. They also were very active in the portal. They did lose Jaquindon Jackson, which is a big loss. It's a big body running back. Did have to play through some injury last year. He's now transferring to Arkansas. Losing Jonah Ellis there off the end was massive as well, even though he's a little banged up down the stretch. But some of the additions in the portal, I do think Utah was one of the beneficiaries of the portal this year. You go out and you get Dorian Singer from Arizona. That's where he started his career. Went to USC. Now he's at Utah. That's a big pickup. I also think Carson Ryan at tight end is massive. When you look at Utah, when they've been at their best, it's when they have two tight ends. So we know they got Brent Keithy. Now we also know they have Carson Ryan, who's well-rounded, very physical blocker at the end of the line of scrimmage, is pretty athletic for a guy of his size. He can get vertical up the seam to off play action. So I think that was a really big pickup for them in the portal. And they also added Stanford safety, uh, Alakai Gilman. So they have a really instinctive player at the safety spot as well, which I think factors in very nicely to what they want to be on that side of the ball. Let's look at the schedule. Southern Utah, that should be a win. Baylor, that should be a win to kick things off. That game will be played in Salt Lake City. They're at Utah State. Should start the season 3-0. and Then you look at September 21st, a road trip to Oklahoma State in Boone Pickett Stadium. I think that's the toughest game on the schedule. I really believe that. I think that's the toughest game on the schedule for the Utah Utes. Arizona is followed by that game, so it's a really tough stretch. Arizona is going to be in Salt Lake, so I like their chances pretty well of being able to handle the home field there and being able to handle their business in that spot. And they go to Arizona State. TCU comes to them at Houston. BYU in a rivalry game renewed. They're at Rice-Eccles Stadium. That'll be in Salt Lake. They're two, They're going to Colorado there on November 16th. That'll be a tricky game, but I don't know what to make of Colorado right now. Like I think Utah matches up really well against the Buffaloes, but I also think Colorado's a real coin flip this year heading into the season. Iowa State, that's at them. And the final game of the regular season is at UCF. I look at what Utah has this year, and I look just how wide the field might be. There's a lot of concerns. There's a lot of question marks about the the Big 12 in general. Who's going to raise their level of play and who's going to kind of fall back to the median? I don't know what to make. The Pac-12, do they have a leg up right now against the Big 12? We'll find out. But it's tough to kind of gauge exactly how they're going to fare. But I love the pieces and the culture 
that Kyle Whittingham and Utah have. So I think the chances of getting to the playoff are actually really high. I put them at the highest right now in the Big 12 at 35%. At number two in the Big 12, the way I'm looking at it right now, a lot of quality pieces return for the Pokes of Oklahoma State. All right, a lot of team, a lot of teams would have loved to have had a season the way they played out last year. Even though the start left an awful lot to be desired, they figured out who they were after the third game of the year and really found some consistency down the stretch. Ollie Gordon, the Doak Walker Award winner, is back. I would imagine he'll probably continue to be a massive factor in this new look Big Twelve. Uh, I think he's going to probably have a huge year. A big thing, last year he ran out of the pistol. Now probably going to get him into more of an offset, traditional shotgun alignment. And if he can continue to develop as a pass catcher out of the backfield, the sky's the limit for what Ollie Gordon can be. You get back Alan Bowman, who's in his seventh year, I believe, was granted another year of eligibility after he's had three uh, season-ending injuries earlier in his career. Him getting that seventh year was massive to kind of create consistency. He's going to manage the game. He's going to get them into the right play. And he's going to make quality decisions and hit some plays down the field. And they have a really solid trio of wide receivers. Brennan Presley, Dejon Stribling, and Rashad Owens. Rashad Owens, a big body receiver. Presley's the slot. And Stribling's a guy that transferred from Washington State last year. Got a little banged up at times last year, but they are very excited about his future there for Oklahoma State. Now, the defense... They've returned mostly intact, as well as the offensive line. Some of the best players off last year's roster are back for this year, and it's just another year in a new scheme. Remember, they run that 3-3-5 scheme there, and it's it's a little bit different with how Brian Nardo and their, and their linebackers are asked to play, their defensive line is asked to play. So that was a bit of a learning curve last year. And I think this year they're going to be much more comfortable running the scheme with a, a little bit more instinctive type of play. And I think they'll be in really good shape there on the defensive side. And I think the schedule is, for the most part, relatively manageable. You get South Dakota State, be careful there. <laughs> I think they'll win it, but be careful in that one for sure. Arkansas comes to them. That'll be a Boone Pickens there on September 7th. I think that game's a toss-up, but I lean Oklahoma State, knowing that Arkansas right now still has an awful lot of questions. They're at Tulsa. Be careful there. <laughs> We've seen Tulsa pull off stunners in the past, especially when they get the opportunity to play against the big boys in the state of Oklahoma. Utah will be coming to them. I think that's a massive game. And seeing who might ultimately get to the Big 12 championship, a win there, I think puts them in prime position to at least get to the Big 12 title game. But the one, these two games at the end of September, they're going to determine everything for Oklahoma State. Utah at home, then they go to Kansas State. They handled Kansas State last year. I think they should be able to maybe do that again. This time it's just going to be a lot more difficult because it'll be played there in the Little Apple. October is a little bit more manageable. West Virginia comes to you. You go to BYU, you go to Baylor, and then you have Arizona State at your place to kick things off in November. You go to TCU there on November 9th. A lot of question marks around the Frogs right now, but one that I would certainly lean towards Oklahoma State. And then you have Texas Tech and then at Colorado to finish up the regular season. Uh, Texas Tech is at home. You're on the road at Colorado, so be careful there. Might be some weather, but a team that wants to run the football, I don't think weather is going to be as much of a factor. So I look at the playoff probability for Oklahoma State. I'm going to put them also at 35%. That's the highest percentage in the Big 12 and what I think is a slightly deeper field than in the ACC. We'll move next to a team that returns just about everybody prior to their coach deciding to leave for Washington. Jed Fish leaves for Washington. And then as a result, they lose six guys to the portal, including their top running back, Jonah Coleman. So Arizona was primed. And their number and their playoff probability probably would have been a little bit higher if not for Jed Fish's departure and having some guys end up the portal as a result. Now, it's always kind of hard to predict exactly how a coaching transition is going to affect the team. I can't accurately tell you exactly what Brent Brennan's going to be able to do, uh, but I do know this. It was massive that he was able to keep Noah Fafita at quarterback and Tetraroa, uh, Tetraroa McMillan at wide receiver. Bringing those guys back is humongous. Also bringing back Jacob Manu at linebacker. who was an all-pack 12 selection a year ago. They bring back a couple pieces along the offensive line as well. Didn't help, though, that they lost some quality pieces to Washington. They lost a couple other guys at the portal that are currently in the portal. But either way, things look pretty good for them. I will say this. They did add Ja'Cory Krosky Merritt. He's not enrolled yet, but he's a transfer running back from New Mexico. So even though they lost Jonah Coleman, I think Krosky Merritt has a chance to be a really good player. 
a really, really good player for them. If you look at Ja'Cory Krosky Merritt and look at his numbers in the last two games of the regular season for New Mexico last year, he went for over 200 in final two games of the year. All he needed was a little bit more touches, a few more runs, and I think he will be able to take some of the pressure off the passing game for Noah Fafita. So keep an eye on him. Let's look at the schedule. New Mexico comes to them, should be able to handle that. Northern Arizona should be able to handle that. And then September 13th or 14th to be announced exactly what day that's going to be played. They'll head to Kansas State. Very, very difficult game there for Arizona. They follow it up the following week after a bye. They go to Utah. So a very tricky game there, I think, for the Arizona Wildcats as well. Texas Tech comes to them. They're at BYU. Colorado comes to Tucson. And then West Virginia comes to Tucson. November, they go to UCF. That'll be a very difficult game, I think. Very tricky game. Still be very, very difficult place to play. We know that Orlando and the Bounce House, they'll be very fired up to welcome Arizona, a team that might be ranked in the top 20, top 15. That'll be a tough place for them to go. We all saw what happened to Oklahoma State last year when they traveled to UCF as a ranked team, as a contender. It didn't end well for the Pokes that day. Houston at TCU and then Arizona State in the rivalry game there in the final week of the regular season. I'm going to put their playoff probability at 25%. Had Jed Fish stuck around and they kind of kept doing what they were doing, I think that number would have been a little bit higher. But some of the turnover, some of the guys that have entered the portal, knowing the depth might be a little bit challenged and they're moving into a new league, I had to drop that number down to around 25%. And let's go finally to Kansas State. Now, the biggest thing... When looking at Kansas State this year, they lost a lot along the offensive line. A lot, including All-American Cooper Beebe. So you also lose Will Howard, but I'm not worried about the quarterback position. I'm not. I think Avery Johnson is poised to step right in and be very solid for Chris Kleiman and that football team. They bring back good playmakers. The the roster, especially on the defensive side, should be in pretty good shape as well. But man, it's a question mark for me. I mean, Kansas State and Chris Kleiman, they are going to be as well coached as anybody. There's no denying that, but the schedule, I think, is very difficult as well. UT Martin at Tulane. Be careful on that road trip to Tulane there on September 7th. Then you get Arizona that comes to you. You're at BYU. Oklahoma State comes to you as well. Then you have a series of tricky road games. Now you have three out of four on the road between September 21st and October 19th. At BYU, then you get Oklahoma State at home. You're at Colorado, and then you're at West Virginia. That, to me, is a very tough stretch for the Kansas State Wildcats. It's not even including the road trip on September 7th to Tulane and then Arizona coming to you. So really, if you want to go a six-game stretch, that's a really tough thing for Chris Kleiman and company to handle it. Will they drop two or three along the way in that stretch? It's certainly possible. Kansas comes to them. That, of course, will be the Sunflower Showdown on October 26th. November 2nd, they go to Houston. Arizona State comes to them. Cincinnati comes to them. They go to Iowa State. So I look at Kansas State right now, and while I have a tremendous amount of respect for Avery Johnson, and I love Chris Kleiman as a head coach, I still think their playoff probability this year, given some of the turnover along the offensive line, I'm going to put that playoff probability at 25%. Finally, before we get you out of here, we'll leave you with some news and notes, things that might impact your viewing experience as a college football fan. ESPN, Fox, and Warner Brothers have officially teamed up to launch a sports streaming platform. Now, what is this going to entail? We don't know exactly just yet. Some of the details are a little bit vague, but in the release, it says this. There's going to be at least 15 networks that are represented, all four major professional sports leagues, and knowing what ESPN and Fox have, there's obviously going to be a ton of college content on there as well. I I can't tell you the details. And a lot of people have started to examine, what does this mean, right? Where are we going? Is this going to ultimately lead to a direct-to-consumer product? Meaning that these... ESPN, Fox, and Warner Brothers are just going to sell all of their content directly to consumers. I think it's highly likely, but I also think at the same time, for my viewing habits, I know what my viewing habits look like, and I know everybody's viewing habits are different. Some people just want to watch their team. Some people want to watch every team. Some people want to watch a specific league. For my viewing habits, I'm going to live on this streaming platform. I feel like... 95% of the content I consume personally outside of having two kids that are under the age of five. So yes, I watch a lot of Paw Patrol. 
Yes, I watch a lot of Noggin. Yes, I watch a lot of Disney+. Plus. Yes, we watch a lot of Blippy on Hulu. Yes, we watch all these things, okay? So when I have control of the remote, though, I know 95% of what I watch are probably on Fox, ESPN, and, Dis and Warner Brothers Discovery. So this is a massive, massive move. I do wonder, I'm very, very curious about what this could mean down the road uh, as far as, hey, if I want to watch Alabama games, do I have to buy each game individually? Are they pay-per-view? Do I subscribe maybe to a season pass for my specific team, much like the MLB has done, similar to what the NFL has done? Will this serve as like a direct TV Sunday ticket there for all sports? I, I don't know those, those answers, but if you're curious and if you're wondering what those 15 networks are, if you're a fan of these networks, these are all gonna be included in the streaming platform. You have ESPN, ESPN Plus, ESPN2, ESPNU, SEC Network, ACC Network, ESPN News, ABC. That's under the ESPN and Disney umbrella. Then you have Fox, FS1, FS2, Big Ten Network. And then you have TNT, TBS, and True TV. So I know, hey, good news I got True TV so I can watch March Madness there on Thursday. All right, really excited about that. That's for sure. That'll do it. All right, I don't know what to tell you about what this is going to mean or how it's going to change your viewing habits. But all I know for me is that if I just have that one streaming platform, I can watch all those things, I'm cooking with gas, man. <laughs> I'm cooking with a lot of gas. So for all of us here at Always College Football, for Mark, Jake, Jack, I'm Greg. We hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.